What's going on, guys? So today we have a special guest that we have been announcing the last few days. Um, he doesn't need much introduction. You probably have seen him in Twitter making big noise. You're in a company that you are a person that struggles hell, yeah? Bring in good energy. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Welcome to Crypto OGs. And it's our very friend, Mr. Mario Nafal. Mario, how are you today? Good, man. How are you, Andres? I'm very good here. I think a little bit in the UK right now. I know you're in Dubai at the moment, correct? Yeah, bro. Nice one. So let's start. So first of all, congratulations. Uh, welcome to the Crypto OGs. It's an absolute honor to have you with us today. Uh, congratulations for all your journey as an entrepreneur. And you inspire many people, not only as an entrepreneur, if not in crypto, NFT, and now with uh, your Twitter space, you are bringing so much valuable information. So let's start with the first question. So tell us a little bit about who is Mario Nafal? Pretty cool guy, lives in Dubai, <laughs> <laughs> dances. So I started I started business a long time ago. I, I, I got into e-commerce in 2012, launched a brand called Fruity, still exists today in over whatever 20 countries doing really well had a record year last year so that was my first business i got into crypto in 2017 ibc got scammed built it up again did really well now skilling it launched nft tech which is now a public company and uh, here i am i do twitter spaces i used to do big clubhouse rooms as well that's where we met andres and it, it, you know that's what brings me to where i am today but who am i i'm a pretty chill guy like i don't meet a lot of people. I hate meetings. I hate calls. And I just wake up, work, go do biohacking. I love biohacking and extending my life. And I dance when I have some time. Amazing. So, yeah, we will talk about biohacking. I mean, I've been watching a couple of episodes for Chris Hanworth uh, that he goes under water in freezing cold weather. So, I probably, when I come to Dubai, we can do the same together so mario yeah as mario mentioned we met in clubhouse probably two years ago uh, we talked about that in a bit but yeah you are part of being the founder of ibc and the ceo of nft technologies you also found as you say the uh, popular names in the wellness industry like hx and optimum but what was the main driving factor for you to move to the blockchain world i was into bitcoin back in 2015 and I was one of the idiots that like, yeah, Bitcoin's cool, but you know, it's probably going to be a, a, a long time before it makes sense. Bitcoin won't survive because of centralization and mining concentration and the tech is too old. And it will probably st started something cool. And, and I was a believer in blockchain. And that was very common back in 2016, 2015, even 2017. I was a believer in blockchain. I just didn't think Bitcoin will be the winner. Obviously I was wrong. Bitcoin is the winner. Uh, but I was also right that blockchain ended up changing and is in progress in process of changing the world. So that's what got me into crypto. And that's from someone who's, again, e-commerce, building a health and wellness brand. I don't know how to build an agency. I don't know. I'm not a techie person. So it was a very um, interesting journey to build IBC in 2017. Amazing. Um that that journey obviously been more than five years the reason why we call crypto is the program is to bring people into the program that has been for at least for two bear markets and obviously you've been through two of them and uh, people have been building sustainable projects and obviously building community in a good way but let's go back a little bit right so before blockchain before everything else. so why inspire you to become an entrepreneur um uh, and why in the wellness field like what was what, what were you were chasing back then? How long ago was this? When did you start as an entrepreneur? So the second question I'll answer first because it's a really interesting one. I, ha I was asked that question two days ago. It's a very simple answer. I don't have a beautiful philosophical answer. I was purely following the money. I don't come okay. from money. I didn't have. I've never seen money. And I was selling different products door to door. My, my goal was to to have more money in my bank account it was that simple and to have a nice car and live a good life and i ended up selling blenders at one stage and that was selling really well and i followed the money i followed what worked 
and I was selling it door to door. Then I sold it on eBay. Then I sold it on the website, and and it kept working, working, working. And obviously, it built through the. And then afterwards, after a year, I'm like, holy shit, I have a business here. I have a brand, and I started building through the the brand it is today over the last whatever ten years or so. Um, now, what got me into entrepreneurship? That's really hard because what what makes someone who they are is usually something you don't know. Why do I say this? Mm -hmm. We get influenced so much, and if you have kids, this is really important. We get influenced mm -hmm. so much by things from our childhood, things that we don't even remember. It could be something as small as a friend saying something or seeing something on the street or now seeing something on TV or on social media. Those things play a bigger role in shaping who you are than mm -hmm. to an extent your parents. So I'm not sure what shaped me to where I am today and who I am today. But it probably played a role in not having money and knowing that I'm missing out on that life of having money. And then what triggered it is what I, when I saw a boy called Farah Gray. I ended up meeting him on Clubhouse a few years ago. Farah Gray made his first million dollars at age 14. And I thought you, wow. could make your, you can become a millionaire late 20s, early 30s. I'm like, holy shit. If anything, I'm late. And um, I immediately you know, started door knocking. I like that you said that you don't have philosophical answer that you were pure for the money um, because yeah most of us we start obviously you know I was from the nine to five uh, corporate structure and I want to make more money really but I want to release time you know and now that we're entrepreneurs we make money but now we don't have enough time and that's when you start to hire people pay more time and obviously live a better life. And you have done that like very well. You have a team around you. I know how professional you are and you are leading your whole team to become a better version of themselves. So, but according to you, what qualities an ideal entrepreneur, entrepreneur has to have? You know, like it has to be perseverance or patience or ambition. What qualities Mario Nafal has and what makes you to people that's in your team or people that are following you on social media and are entrepreneurs? I'm I'm fighting between two qualities that it, it would help an entrepreneur. I would put as the first one just to make money, uh, mm -hmm. being having the hustle, being driven is probably the most important. And I put intelligence as number two. Intelligence helps a lot, but it's not a necessity if you work your ass off. Because if you if you're an idiot in crypto in 2017, all you do is have to hustle. And you'd make money. If you were in crypto in 2015, you had to do very little to make money. So, and it's the same with other industries. So, if you're in the right place at the right time, and there's ways to find where to be at the, and, and when to be there, and you just work your ass off, you'll probably be able to make money. Now, if you're looking at making 100 million dollars plus, you need intelligence. Otherwise, it's highly, highly unlikely you'll get there. So I'd say the two most important qualities is hard work is number one, intelligence as number two. In terms of what qualities I have, um, um, I'm very self-aware. Like I know my weaknesses. So I hire people to cover for my weaknesses. That's a really big one. I'm very, very self-aware mm -hmm. and very objective. Like I don't get emotionally attached to things. If, for example, if I invest, we invested in 100 and something projects. If I invest in a project, and it's it's something is you know it's not performing as we expected. I don't have a bias to keep convincing myself the project will do well because I invested in it. I'll cut my losses short and move on because I'm very objective and unemotional about these things. So those are my strengths over like intelligence and and I work my fucking ass off. Like I I'm, I I work a lot, especially before. You do work a lot. Like I've seen you like going always in Twitter spaces for five, six, seven, eight hours. And before in Clubhouse. Do you remember Clubhouse? Do you remember Clubhouse? Yeah. That was it insane, was cool. man. That was crazy. <laughs> we didn't have anything to do. Like, obviously, we were in the pandemic and we couldn't go anywhere. I think so you went to Dubai. So, but you anyway, you were there with me from the beginning going for six. It was crazy. I don't think I can do that ever again, but it was good experience. So, I, I'm happy that we met in there. Um, Okay, so yeah, being perseverance, obviously, if if you are lucky, like you say, depending on the market of, of cryptocurrency, you were like before the bear market, you joined the bull market, a lot of people make money, but yeah, to create a hundred million dollars, 
you need to have a, uh, not only be smart, you know, hiring people that is, is smarter than you, right? So let's talk about very, the next very step. Very, right. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the next step for Mario. So what's coming up in the next chapter of your entrepreneur life? Um, and it will be more blockchain or crypto, or crypto specific or, or you're thinking about something else? My full focus financially is going to be crypto. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm 100%. Well, you can never be 100%, but I'm very, 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 very confident that I will, per, you know, I will continue doing what we're doing, acquiring assets and partnering and accelerating more projects throughout the bear market where projects need help more than ever uh, in preparation for the bull market. So I'm not looking at any other industries. Obviously, my e-commerce business is still operating. I'm not involved at all. And uh, I've got my Twitter space that is kind of more than just crypto now. It's more world events and politics. It become, it, it become a giant, the Twitter space. We will talk about the, the giant of the round table and they will probably give us a little bit of insights to people how everything starts. But I forgot to ask you something about your entrepreneurial life. So yeah, you've been years and years an entrepreneur, but define one moment that changed your life. That moment like, it 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 pick everything like you said that moment I met this person or I took the decision or I went into a bankruptcy or I got this call from somebody. What's that moment that changed your life as an entrepreneur that it take you where you are here today? So I was watching a YouTube video. Um I was at university doing banking and finance in Australia at Monash University. And I'm just going through YouTube and I would be studying like crazy. I'll tell you how extreme I was studying, man. Let me just take notes. I want to write a note of the Chris Hemsworth documentary that you mentioned. Um, yes. And uh, so I, can, I want to watch it. Yeah, I know it. I know it. I, I put a note a while ago to watch it. And I forgot. So I just put a note again. The second so, episode of this. I'll watch it. Um, so you asked me what triggered me. So I was studying like crazy. I'll tell you how extreme I was. I would download random to- topics from Wikipedia. I'd go to Wikipedia, choose a random mm-hmm. topic, print it. 20, 30 pages, read it and try to memorize it. I would read books every day. I would spend 15 hours a day just learning and studying. I was doing my banking and finance course. I was doing a technical analysis course at another another institution. I was doing online courses at Harvard and uh, MIT and other universities because they would put their lectures online. Mm -hmm. So I was educating myself like crazy because my goal was to get as intelligent as I can be. Now, I watched a video on YouTube of a, because I, I thought I'd get rich later. You know, I'll, I'll do it in my 30s. Mm-hmm. There's plenty of time. There's no way to get rich before. It's not possible. And I watched that video by a boy called Farah Gray, as I said. Mm-hmm. And in that YouTube video, he's being interviewed and he's talking about how he was just a hustler. He's like mowing loans and, and then someone was mentoring him and he made his first million. I'm like, holy shit. Not only am I not too young to make money, I was like 20, whatever. And I could even be too too old this guy made it a million dollars at 14 i immediately dropped out of university i was doing really really well it was my second year out of three dropped out of university stopped educating myself tried to get the first job which ended up being a door knocking job at a company called royal springs they hired me on a commission only basis which of wow. course they are because they don't pay me a retainer and i'm like sick and immediately after he interviewed me in his car he was at a client's um office the guy interviewed me, his name is Bill, interviewed me in the car, gives me flyers, go and start selling the product. We had to give free trials for a water filter. I walked mm-hmm. out of the car and started knocking on doors. I don't know how I had the guts to do it because I was a very proud and private person. I don't like, like, I was very, very, pride was very important to me. Like, I didn't hate people disrespecting me. People are going to shit on you if you're knocking on doors. And I just got my flies yeah. and started knocking on doors, and it was the, it was so difficult. But the feeling of getting trials and getting that money, so getting deals for a free trial, and getting paid for it, was thrilling. That's what gave me the adrenaline to keep going. And I made thousands of dollars per week every week. I was doing a lot of money from day one, so it's, it's I'm grateful for that. 
Well, so basically the hustling and just taking risks and obviously going against your fears and making it anyway. So in a personal note, Mario, when I was 20, I was knocking door as well while I was studying computer engineering. And yeah, it's, it's the fact, you know, in Colombia, the education system is totally different in Europe or, or Australia. Like to get to uni is really expensive. And then obviously we have so many social levels in Colombia, like you are poor, middle class and rich. And then the fact that I was going to a uni was quite nice, but the fact that my uh, classmate discovered I was selling stuff door to door, it scared me a lot. But now, bouncing back, just remembering that, I think so that helped me a lot to where I am. So we, we shared that in common as well. Okay, Mario, let's dive into Web3 NFT. It's been crazy the last, okay, the last, the last year, the last five years, but, Tell us a little bit about your journey with the IBC group and where all the ideas is coming to get teams together, supporting projects and doing research and obviously helping them with marketing and structure and all of that. Where, where everything start for, for blockchain with you? Yeah, so this 2018 was really rough. 2018, crypto just died. Um, there was no VC money coming in. Mm. People were just leaving the industry. And I was just recovering from a scam. Like we lost millions of dollars. So it was yeah. really, really rough for me. And I didn't expect 2022 to be as bad as it is. I knew it was going to mm -hmm. get bad. I just didn't expect something like FTX or three hours capital to happen. That was, that was really surprising to me. Even Luna. Luna. Even Luna. Like all these things are just they're very very unexpected black swan events, which is what black swan events are. Yeah. Uh, but it, it doesn't change much. The projects are still building. There's less money in the ecosystem, but they've raised a lot of money. That they have more than enough money to build. Gamers are still playing decentralized games that they enjoy. DeFi is still being used. Um. All these different NFTs, the, the, the quality ones are building an ecosystem around them. They're doing partnerships. They're doing deals. So like the real use cases, Polygon is doing partnership after partnership every damn week. The real use cases, which is what we've been talking about since 2017, is like we need, we don't need speculation. We don't need money flowing around. We need people using the protocols. We need people using the technology. That hasn't changed. So despite FTX, they might delay things. They might put prices down for longer. Despite all that shit, the fundamentals changed very little. What changed mm -hmm. is the amount of money and the sentiment. So, okay, let's, we're going to get more into depth about what is happening right now, you know? So... Why are your thoughts like you have heard, you've been so many hours in the Twitter space and uh, the roundtable? We talk more about it, but please share your thoughts on how we can avoid some of the damage that happened this year, you know, like, well, DeFi with Luna and all of that, and then FTX. How do you think we can avoid this and all these crypto scams in the near future? Or no avoid, maybe make like trying to everybody to be more smart about their decision, right? The answers are, uh, one is a simple answer. One is a bit more, um, a bit more controversial. So the first simple one is education. I think teaching people mm -hmm. will continue to help uh, what, what self custody means, how to use a wallet, etc. But people are people. Like even if they have yeah. their own wallet and their own private key, not everyone's unable to, like, I'm really bad at saving things. Like, I have a big safe right here next to me. I have a big safe, you know, the big safe one. Um, yeah. And I've never used it. It's been there for two months. I bought it to put things securely. It's a really big, heavy one. Can't be fucked, like, knowing how to open it and stuff. So the second reason, the second way we could avoid these things is something that, again, a lot of people disagree with me. But the world we live in has built systems to make up for our imperfections as a species. Like we're really bad as a species. Like we're, we've got so many flaws. So there's the legal yeah. systems, the ethics system, 
uh, and, and the way of doing business, etc., that ensures that we operate within a certain, uh, certain, certain boundaries, to say the least, or a certain way of doing things. Like you can't go on the street and punch someone. No, you can't take money from someone, say, I'll pay you back and never pay them back. Like those are things that will not allow the system to work. Now, mm -hmm. crypto is aiming for decentralization. Great. And what crypto and blockchain, what, what we're trying to implement is implement those same systems that are currently being run technically by people at the top. I'm not saying people are controlling the world. I'm just saying people build the systems and it's still dependent on people. People still play a key role in those systems. We're trying to replace that by coding it in. So code is law. You've heard that statement many times in crypto. So what we're trying to do is shift that, that, that system we built in the physical world and put it into code. But that will take a really long time. There'll be many flaws as we try to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So what we should do in the short to medium term is we should embrace, not fully embrace, of course, that question and, and try to make sure that it's, it's, it's adapted to our space. But we should embrace the legal systems. We should embrace the regulators. I know that sounds crazy. We should embrace what we've built over so many decades in the physical world and work with them to make sure they understand and they help the, the crypto world. But making regulators our enemy will only backfire and will mm -hmm. only allow people like SBF and others to get away with the shit they've been doing. And mm -hmm. we cannot just tell regulators to leave us alone in the middle of the bull market and then beg them and blame them and beg them to come help when things implode, as we saw with SBF and FTX. I agree with you. Yeah, we need we need to work in a way that not only the regulators but also the the innovators can come up together. Obviously, this will take time. It's only been eleven years this technology building up. Um, I hope. I hope you're taking notes, guys. So, by the way, Mario, we have about two thousand people watching right now on Binance Live. So. Hello to everybody. There's a lot of people joining across the globe. Uh, you have any question for Mario? You leave in the chat in, in Binance Live. Um, and remember, guys, everything that Mario and me were saying uh, is our own opinions. Uh, do your own research. This is not financial advice. Very important. So let's talk about the round table. So for many people that probably don't know Mario since Clubhouse, let me just do a little bit of intro. So I met Mario in Clubhouse 2020, was 2020, 2020, wow, it goes, no, 2021, sorry, 2021, uh, I can't remember. No, yeah, we met in 2020, 20, yeah, we met in, in December 2020 is when we started, and then I was off mid-2021 February, mid-February. It was crazy. So, guys, yeah, we met, I, I, I saw this guy doing, I remember we were doing tutorials. You were doing tutorials about how to use uh, Clubhouse. That was the first role. You remember that? You remember the early, yeah. early days? Holy shit. It was like 2,000 people joining to the how I create a, a, a Clubhouse room. It was amazing. And it inspired me a lot, Mario, because I said, this guy is just doing it. You know, he's putting the hours. Nobody's teaching how to do this. And he's connecting with a lot of people. And I remember I started to do the same, but in Spanish. So we have the round table in Spanish. It used to be called La Mesa Redonda. And yeah, I just focused in the Spanish community. It was great. But you, suddenly you took off. Like it was so big. You actually, you have Elon Musk in the round table on Clubhouse. And I think so the maximum audit that you have like 20,000. I can't remember. I, and then you have like all these big celebrities, Paris Hilton. I can't. There's so many names that joined your space that was crazy. So if you probably think like Mario, he just jumped in Twitter space and he just did it this overnight. No, he's been putting hours. I probably say probably 10 hours in average when he was in Clubhouse a day for three, four, five months. And then not really there, there's something that happened and then uh, it leads you to, to join Twitter space. Obviously, Twitter space, it wasn't that name back then, but now... With Elon joining, it's been crazy. Before we talk about the last month for your program and to trade space, tell us about your journey of the roundtable the last year. I know you've been constant. That's the good thing about you. You have a team. You are very well educated, but also there is a lot of stuff that will ask you that that plays a big role to moderate a room like this. It's not that easy. But tell us about your journey this year in the roundtable. Yeah, man, like we met when I started my first room on Clubhouse, um, 
Kaylin convinced me to do a room, and it was 14 people. 14 people with, I don't know what we were talking about. He was like interviewing me or talking about business. And then the next day, I did my second room, and it was 30 people. And the next day, it was like 100. And then I'm like, all right, let me, let me double down on this. So I get a couple of team members, and you know, I mean, I'm pretty aggressive in marketing. So I get a couple of team members, and we start connecting with all the moderators there to bring me up on stage because that's the game. you got to come up on stage and speak uh-huh. and you just get people following you and then you're in the circle. <laughs> it was so, so, so political and and and, and anyway. tribal. It was insane. So I would get into those circles and then come up on stage and some people like you, some people don't like you. They're very competitive. It was insane. Um, and that was like my first time ever I speak on any stage. Okay? That was like, oh, I, wow. I used to be very private, man. Like, before 2018, if you Googled my name, there was nothing about me. Nothing. No Instagram, no Facebook, no, 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 no YouTube account. Zero. I was a very, very, very private person. But then when I got scammed, the reason I got scammed is because the person that I worked with took advantage of me being private. And even my employees didn't know who I was. And they kind of started you know, scamming the company, taking money off me, taking clients and, and funds and stuff. So that's, that's what triggered me to start my personal brand, start creating content. I was really, you know, had a following on LinkedIn, but Clubhouse was the really big one, the first big one. So we had 15 people in the first room, 30, 60, and then a couple of hundred, which was really good. And then it started going up to 1,000. In the early days, that was a lot, and 2,000, 3,000. And then it became the biggest daily room on Clubhouse. I would spend hours on there, not making money. I, like, I've never sold anything on Clubhouse, ever. Um, so that was, like, my goal was just to build an audience. Obviously, Clubhouse died. We started Twitter Spaces really early, but it was too small. And then I took a, took time off, focused on my businesses on IBC and NFT Tech, which we took public. It's now listed in Canada and Europe. And then I'm like, all right, let me, let me, the bear market is here. I have time. Let me get back into Twitter Spaces. That was about three months ago, four months ago, maybe even five now. And we started a room. We did it. We had Tom Nash and a bunch of others come on. And we had 4,000 people at a time. That's concurrent. Total, we had like 60,000 people listen. And it immediately became the biggest space in crypto from day one. Now, it took us months to prepare for it. There's a whole, you know, there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes to get Mm -hmm. these numbers. And it cost a lot of money, man. I paid tens Mm -hmm. and tens of thousands of dollars for that first room just for that space. You know, probably $60,000 for the first space, it went down afterwards. Now you have you have an audience that will just join. So I don't have to do, I don't have to pay anything for marketing. But it was a lot of money, a lot of time. But I only did it once a week. Then, but it was a long one. It was like a nine hour, eight, nine hour space. Wow. Um, not seven hours, six, seven hour probably. And then, um, then I made it twice a week. One NFT, one crypto. And then mm-hmm. FTX happened. You remember that. So when FTX happened, I was covering it. We were doing our normal space. We started talking about FTX and the rumors around it. And then live on stage, I asked Kyle, who was my co-host. I'm like, Kyle, are you worried about all this all this fear? And CZ tweeted about SPF and the token was dropping. Um, the FTT token was dropping. And I'm like, are you worried? He's like, Mario, I wasn't worried until five seconds ago, 10 seconds ago. Someone from my team just told me that FTX halted withdrawals. Now I'm worried. Wow. And shit started to go down. All of us on the space for like 10 hours, experiencing the whole thing live. And then I bring up Chet, who was my co-host, and he would like, he'd hear that ting, ting. He'd have breaking news. He'd share the breaking news. We were all experiencing the entire implosion live on stage. We had everybody on stage. And while we're experiencing that implosion, we had exchanges come on. We had CZ come on. We had um, uh, the three hours capital, Zuzu come on. Everybody was coming on as we all to see FTX collapse live on stage with tens of thousands of people listening. So that was the experience that we had. And then we even saw the hack when, when FTX got hacked and the funds were moving. We were watching on chain the funds get moved and there's people in the audience that had money with FTX and they're seeing all that money leave and they're like, fuck, their heart is just dropping. It was insanely emotional for many. We had Elon Musk drop by. We had CZ. We had the, a lot of exchanges came in. Kraken, uh, Jesse from Kraken. And then we had politicians come in, regulators were listening, and we had the premier of Barbados, we had uh, the ex-chief of staff, I think, of uh, of the US, Mick Mulvaney, um, and the list goes on. All these influential people and policymakers, we had people from the SEC listening, um, 
to the no. entire space. And, and then since then, the space kind of evolved into more of a breaking news and world events. So whenever something happens, everyone knows the space will be there, crypto or non-crypto, and we'll be covering it live in an impartial, objective way. It's crazy, like, that. that's how, how to pray. Because I've been there, obviously, you know, with the, what happened with, with FTX and Sam, but I have run rooms and clubhouse, and I remember when the stuff was happening. And I have to go back a little bit, and then we come back to FTX and what happened the last three weeks. So there is an enormous amount of energy when you're hosting the rooms. I want to make sure everybody understand this. And you probably see Mario there with his uh, crypto pong, just talking and say, oh, this guy is crazy because he's well spoken. He probably has so, so many friends, that, but, but it's a lot of energy, effort. And also you have to be very, um, let's say, political correct. You know, you have to be, basically you cannot please everybody. That's the other thing. You cannot please everybody. You have so many people send you DMs. So it's a, mentally and physically. I remember, Mario, when I was doing the club car room for a long time, I was eating like while I was talking. And when somebody was talking about just eating and drinking, it was crazy. Even to go to a toilet, I have to get that motion quick. So go to a toilet and come back. It, it, it's insane. So, guys, if you are listening, Mario, in Twitter space, he's there because he has put the hours, but also because this is about intentions. Something that Mario gained my respect massively is because I remember in Clubhouse, you had a beef with Grant Cardone because you said that you didn't sell uh, courses or something like that. At the very beginning, that he, I don't know, you went into his, his Clubhouse and then you said something, I can't remember. But then after one week or two weeks, he came into your Clubhouse room. I said, wow, this guy, you know, this is something you need to understand. You have to try to be house you have to be very active in in these spaces and just do it the right way and then you gain the respect Andres, i've had i've had i've had you mentioned grant like me and grant didn't know each other personally so there was no animosity but there was a disagreement we had on clubhouse that was nothing because i've had people that hate me i've had people yeah, that yeah. talk shit about me I bring them up on stage and then everyone's like mario what are you doing bringing up on stage they did a room attacking you yesterday no joke People went, made a room that had nothing better to do than attack me. It's so weird. I bring them up on stage. I'm like, guys, I don't really care. Like, I'm not here to bring people I like. I'm just here to, if they know, if they have something interesting to say about the topic we're discussing. The stage is theirs. Whether they like me or don't like me is is irrelevant to me. Uh, and, and there's been many examples of this in the last few weeks. And I try to be as unemotional and as objective as yeah. possible. Um, and of course, you're going to get hate, man. Like, when I have... Elon Musk coming into my room a couple of times and spending hours in my space, or when I have, you know, 2.1 million people listen to a space, of course people are gonna hate. Of course the media is not gonna be mm -hmm. happy. I'm not hating on the media, but some of them might not be happy. I'm getting all that attention. They might think, hey, we've been in the media for 20 years and we don't get that much reach. Uh -huh. That's normal. Of course, other people, maybe people have been doing spaces longer than me and they haven't reached that level. Um, so I respect this. And I just, if they hate me, I don't have any hate back. I know it sounds cheesy, but like, I'm not going to waste my energy on it. I love it. I love what you're saying right now because, okay, and this, now let's, let's talk about the last two weeks. Um, but I just want to give the perspective to the audience. And I love this from, let's say, from the real world. You know, people like you, like me, like we come from nothing. And then it's, it was our intention that put us where we are right now. And obviously thinking long term, right? That it, but this is what is in us to also know growth as individuals, also our companies, but also the team around us. But now let's talk about the recent episode. You have obviously CC joined the space, then a couple of people from exchange, but how you manage to get Obviously, Elon Musk joined because he saw the run and he, he had joined the clubhouse room before. And he's everything about journalism and giving free speech to people, right? But you post SBF, you know, Sam, for the first thing after the FTX call out. He probably had a million of requests to speak on a stage. Um, and I listened to the interview and all of that. You have good people co-hosting and helping you. But what were your thoughts following the interview of, about the whole storyline? What, what do you think, like, okay... You finish the Twitter space, you take your headphones, and what were your first thoughts after that? My first thought is finally, because I'd okay. be exhausted. Man, 
the first space when CZ <laughs> came and Elon came the first time he came into the space, I was awake for 40 something hours. Wow. So my first thought is finally. Um, otherwise, I'm not that emotional about it. So, you know, I've already had Hunter Biden on the show. I've already had Elon Musk on the show. I've had CZ. I've had the uh, like, and I have Andreessen, Mark Andreessen is coming on the show on Tuesday. We have Gorka coming yeah. on the show on Saturday. Uh, he used to work at the Trump administration. We have, uh, I cannot say who it is yet. I'll probably say it in the next couple of days, but probably the biggest name right now in the world is coming on our stage in January. Like I've, I've had all these names, so I'm very unemotional about it. Like it's just mm-hmm. another person coming in and, and just chatting. Um, and I just, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm just so calm about it now beforehand in the early days it was a lot more intense because here we are starting with a space talking to 5,000 people before and then suddenly you ha- you're the place to be oh what really bothered me is I I'm, I'm very ethical in life like I've never and I'm very transparent as well like if anyone looks at the facts and like looks at my wallet looks at my data my emails talks to people that know me and looks at everything they're like okay this guy has been you know, he probably lost a lot of money because he didn't do a lot of things he could have done. Just to maintain, not mm-hmm. launch an NFT, not launch a token, not accept some clients, not get into certain industries. So when I, I thought when I gained attention, I never, I know that hate comes with attention. Mm-hmm. Everybody gets through it. Every, every single person goes through it. I never thought I will. I thought I was immune because I'm like, what is there to hate about? Like I'm, I'm just a guy doing a space and doing well. Like I'm, there's not nothing there. And I'm usually I'm usually impartial. Like I don't take sides, and I'm objective. Yeah. So there's no side that should hate me, bro. From day one, immediately. Because what happens? I didn't know. So what happens is when you're blowing up, anyone that writes about you, their whatever they write will get engagement because it's about you, and you're like the talk mm-hmm. of town. So when I was was when everyone was in our space, everyone was talking about our space. That means people that tweet things about me, find a picture about me or a video about me or make up a story, and tweet it it's more likely to go viral. And so in the early days, I saw a lot of that and that was really unexpected because that was happening while I'm doing my space, but I didn't know. I don't have time to go through the comments, look at the tweets for like two days because I'm just hosting the space. No time to breathe, man. Like I was going to sleep and in my dreams, I'm running a space and I'm hearing the beep, beep. Like I was, for for, for, four, this is my room I'm in now. I didn't leave my room for almost a week, six, seven days, didn't leave my room. It was insane. So I didn't have time to look at freaking comments. And then I, when I finally tuned out and I looked at like, holy shit, like people still managed to find a way to hate on me. And um, that was really, really um, surprising. That's what really bothered me back then. I'm over it now. I'm pretty chill. Um, but yeah, so like it was, it, I, did a, I did an event after doing my space. I spoke at an event here in Dubai. Um, I accepted because of a friend that asked me. And, and usually I'm pretty good when I speak on stage. Like I've done it a, a lot. And he said to me, Mario, for the first time ever, it's like you were still in the metaverse, in the in the virtual world, in the space. Because I asked you one thing, you asked me something completely different, and you're like in another world. I've never seen you like this. Because I was still recovering from that marathon of spaces that I had to go through. It was wow. it was so, so, so weird and difficult to explain the feeling. And, and I don't have to do this shit. Like, I'm financially well off. I, I, I really don't have... To do it, um, but then again, I did. <laughs> because, but we love it. It was this the pattern of, of FTX and Sam that you went to the stage later, or was before? No, no. So that was after the because um, after the uh, before the FTX Sam one, it was like I had days for break. It was during when it was I was doing Jitex. it twenty four seven. So that, that was, Jitex, was yeah? I spoke. No, Jitex was before the implosion. I forgot the uh, event's name. I forgot what it is. Um, a, a, a Gaurav Dubey from TD5 was interviewing me. Or we were chatting together, fireside chat. And it was right after the implosion. Um, so after FTX, like five, seven, seven, eight days after FTX, um, you know, the, the CZ tweeted right, his um, tweet against FTX. Probably eight days afterwards. Yeah, that's when I went out and did the did the, the chat. Because we met in Jitex. Jitex was before the implosion. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, we met with Mario after two years face to face. After two years, yeah, it was good seeing you. But yeah, we took. Yeah, you're you're, you're built, man. You're you're a big guy. You you you're work you're working out, man. I, I remember seeing you there. 
You're intimidating. In one year, I was in the army in Colombia, so that helps. That helps a lot. There you go. Uh, Mario, look, this is this is something that probably people ask you all the time, right? So, uh, Elon Musk, the biggest name, like, in Twitter, he bought a Tesla, SpaceX, billionaire, crazy guy. Everybody loves him or hates him. So, he, he attended the round table a couple of times. So, what? Well, and what was the most interesting point when he came to the show? Like, what do you learn the most? And how was like in like next next week he showed, let's say, on the metaverse in the Twitter space? Hmm. Yeah, so I spent a lot of time chatting to Elon because uh, he's been in, in, with us a couple of times, and, and the second, the, the 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 latest one spent a lot of time with us. The, the biggest highlight from that space was when he talked about his um, his fear on his life and he mm. said you know he said something along like if I everyone all the media was talking about it and um, so you'll see it all over the news but something about if you if you see me like if someone says I committed suicide I didn't I have no suicidal thoughts which is someone that someone would say this if they think someone will kill them now I don't know how serious he was but one a feeling that I got is like how scary it would be to be Elon or anyone in power, but someone in power that's that disruptive. So yeah. Elon is is pissing off so many people and has so much influence and is breaking the system, agree or disagree, that's not the point I'm making. It's just going against the system. I'm not saying it's a good thing or bad thing. I'm just making a point. Mm -hmm. That has risks involved with it and that has a lot of pressure a lot of people relying on him so for me i'm like like it's like whatever pressure i feel in my life he's probably feeling 10x that pressure because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always feeling responsible for people that work with me people around me he's responsible for thousands and thousands of people and he's impacting millions of people so the amount of weight on his shoulders must be exhausting. And every time I think, like, I'm like, man, just just stop and chill. Like, relax. But no, he just keeps going and going and going. Like, after fucking surviving with Tesla, almost going bankrupt, to doing it, getting SpaceX to the tunnels um, and the neuro, not neuroscience, whatever, the, the things for the brain. I haven't looked into it. And now you've, he acquires Twitter. And shakes up the entire company and starts taking jabs at everyone else. I'm like, holy shit! When is it gonna stop, man? It's it's insane. The guy is the guy is 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 a different level. I, I like Elon a lot. I I start to read his book. Uh, well, it's a biography. It's like Tesla, Space, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future by Ashley Vance. That's how I to go to know him, like through the book and then obviously through your Twitter Spaces. But also we have. Uh, somebody that my in Clubhouse, his name is Sebastian Torres. He used to work for SpaceX as the technique lead of the engines that are uh, going to, well, it's going to space. So we, uh, we we share a couple of thoughts with him because he worked with him six years next to him. So, yeah, Elon Musk is a fantastic character and we have to learn a lot from him. But let's move a little bit from um, the round table. But before that, what is coming for the roundtable in 2023? Are you planning to make it bigger or different? Or what is coming for the table in 2023? I was just on a call before this 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 interview, brainstorming this exact point. It a lot of it depends on where Twitter goes, and it seems that Twitter is heading in in a pretty interesting direction. It's scaling mm. beyond what it is today. It's looking at in, you know potentially bringing back Vine and. Office, offering monetization structures for creators, etc. So it's really interesting to see how how Twitter goes. But if Twitter continues growing and Spaces continues being what it is today, um, looking at creating, I, I've always said this. Me, I love, everyone loves to talk about media being biased, and that's true. But social media is full of echo chambers as well. Yeah. People on the right create a, 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 a space or a channel or, or a room or whatever you want to call it. And everyone on the right goes there and it becomes like an entire circle jerk. Everyone's just agreeing with each other. People on the left, same story. So what I want to try to do is try to bring a non-biased 
space area, whatever, ecosystem, or let's call it a space, a non-biased space for both sides to come and debate and listen to each other and learn from each mm -hmm. other. And that's been a so, so, it's, it's so difficult, so difficult. People hate others that disagree with them. But <laughs> thankfully, so far it's going well. The last show we did, we had people from the right and the left, and they agreed on many things. Um, I'm trying my best to balance it out, but it's it's a really hard thing. And some people just don't want to do it. They just like, hey, I only want to speak in an echo chamber where no one disagrees with me and everyone likes agrees with me, likes what I have to say, and that's it. And which I think is worse than biased media. Um, so that's what we're trying to do and trying to do it on a on a bigger scale. And it's been going pretty well so far. Amazing. So you're doing a fantastic job with that Twitter space and congratulations. Now let's move into NFTs. So I know that that's one of your passions, NFTs, you know, um, but we have witnessed a very fluctuating curve over the past few months, basically just tank, right? So do you think it will stabilize, people will realize the potential of NFT? I saw your uh, um, speech in Cebu in London, that was six weeks ago, seven weeks ago. I hear you talk, but I know you're very passionate about NFT. Do you think the, the people will really understand the utility and they will start to use it eventually as it has to be and not only a JPEG? Can you show me your phone? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just briefly. When did you buy this, approximately? Uh, two years ago. And it was worth more then than it is now. It went down in value, correct? Yeah, it went down. Okay. So why am I using this as an example? In the physical world, when we buy something, where's my phone? When I, we buy something and it goes down in value, we don't, we're, we're fine with it. Some things go up in value, some things go down in value. We used it for a certain purpose. Some things don't change in value, like my ID. Where's my ID? Or this is my gym card or my, my ID card. So some things don't change in value. Interesting. But what matters is that we own them. Whether we own them to use them, we own them to increase in value, or we own them to, to not change in value but also to use them. Now, when we talk about NFTs, what are NFTs? It's the same thing. It's digital ownership. You own a digital version of your ID. You own a spaceship mm. in a game. You own a financial instrument. It could be anything. All what NFTs represent is digital ownership. It could be a loyalty card for Starbucks, which they're working on it, or it could be a ticket for a certain event. Why is it an NFT? Because your ticket is different to anyone else. You have your own C at that event. It's your own ticket with your own name on it, so it's an NFT. So... People are confusing NFTs with those pictures, like my CryptoPunk mm -hmm. and others, and thinking that this is what NFTs are. No, these are just collectibles, digital collectibles. They use NFT technology, but they're not what NFTs represent. They're a small, 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 small piece of that iceberg. Very, very small. So for people listening, NFTs have not, the, the, the adoption has, hasn't changed, it hasn't gone down. Speculative assets have, and rightly so. Stocks go down, NFTs go down. That's the, that's the ecosystem. Now, do I see PFPs go back up in value? Likely, yes. Some the the blue chip, the one that do a good job, will go up in value. Mm -hmm. They have a purpose. You know, I have a CryptoPunk because I believe in the in the in, in that it was the first. So it has historical value. You know, apes have value in the ecosystem they build. Could go to zero, of course. If the metaverse they build, no one uses it. Everyone hates it. Apes will probably fall in value significantly because their utility went down in value. But in terms of NFTs, Polygon is announcing partnership after partnership with companies willing, wanting to implement various things on the blockchain through NFT technology to allow people to own something. And as the digital world evolves, people would want to own more things in that virtual world because they spend more time in it. So whether you own a spaceship in a game, this is the example I used earlier, or whether you own shoes in a metaverse, or you own a crypto punk that allows you to walk, walk in the metaverse. All these are different concepts of ownership. Not all of them are there to make you money. Okay. 
you answered so many questions in one glass. Why don't I ask you three more questions? <laughs> but you already answered it. it has to be with the metaverse, with the utilization of NFTs, and also what is coming for the next models. Uh, but we're nearly wrapping up, Mario. I have only two more questions for you. And this is non-crypto related. Um, I know you will do more Twitter space and people will learn more about crypto NFTs, metaverse and blockchain because you have an amazing, amazing guest when you bring it to the show. So it's a very good, good, good way to learn. So if you don't follow Mario, you're new in Binance Life, I go and follow him. It's at Mario Nafal, like his name. Uh, but Mario, let's talk a bit outside of, of crypto and blockchain, entrepreneur shield, everything else. You love dancing. That's something that I found fascinating, you know, bachata, because I'm from Colombia. I actually, I know very good dancing in bachata. I know how to dance salsa, merengue, reggaeton, all of that, because I was born in Colombia. But bachata, salsa, bachata, you, I saw you in Jaitix in Dubai um, with Jennifer. You dance very well. Tell us about this. I, I think so there's a way that you disconnect from your job, obviously. And that way you probably connect with your emotions. But tell us why bachata, how do you learn and why you keep doing it? Yeah, I love crypto, but I'm sick of hanging out with people in crypto 24 <laughs> seven. So I need an exit. I need an exit. Need so dancing is my, yeah, man. <laughs> exit. Like I, crypto is brutal. Business is brutal. Like anyone yeah. launching a business, if you, if, it doesn't matter how wealthy someone is, if you're still going to be hustling, even if you're a billionaire, we talked about Elon Musk. I'm sure Elon Musk sits down sometimes like say, geez, I'm fucking tired. I'm sure he does that because it is really, really hard. And when I got scammed in 2018, like I needed an exit out of life. And that exit was dancing. So dancing was, it, it ticked a few boxes for me. It was an exit from the pain of entrepreneurship. It was also a way for me to socialize because I'm not a very social person. It was a great way for me to meet girls as well because you dance with a girl. That's how bachata works. And I could do it anywhere in the world. I travel, I traveled and still travel a lot. And I've been traveling for years. And I can dance bachata anywhere in the world, anywhere I go. Whether it's the US, whether it's Romania, whether it's Colombia, whether it's Dubai. I can go find a bachata party and, and go dance. So I used to do that a lot. And now I travel to, to bachata festivals around the world. That's amazing. And what do you think, like, this is from my a personal question from me to you, why do you think Latin American rhythms and vibes are so addictive and why they're taking over the world? Like, you, I go to Moscow, I go to Vietnam, it's like reggaeton, bachata. Why do you think that's happening? What, what is going on with the Latin American rhythms? I don't know, you guys, you guys are sexy, man. Like, you guys, you guys know how to... <laughs> How to, how to have fun, man. Like, I, I don't know why. <laughs> like, this, I was re reading a study because you have you get a lot of sun. Apparently, when you get a lot of sun, it makes people happier. And, mm -hmm. like, people in Nordic countries have higher depression rate because they get less sun. I haven't looked into this, guys. So I just a study I heard somewhere. I'm sure there's a million reasons. It's part of the culture. But, like, you guys, like, what do you expect? Like, you expect people in Dubai to come up with a sexy dance? Or you expect people in Sweden or Russia to come up? <laughs> no, it's got to be Latin Americans coming up with a dance like this. And we just copy you guys. Oh, that's that's a good answer. So, Mario, I hope that hopefully we can go to one of these bachata sales uh, festival because yeah, crypto you stay can be draining. Talking about protocols, tokenization, roadmaps, all of that. Yeah, we need escape of reality. And for me also, dan I love dancing, so we have some that's in common. So yeah, we're wrapping up. Mario it has been an honor to have you here because you are crypto G. Uh, we have a surprise for you. I know you love NFTs. So we have this artist called Andre Cayane from Colombia, but he lives in Abu Dhabi. And he's going to create an NFT in your favorite animal. So which one is your favorite animal? Oh, yeah, that was on the questionnaire. Um, <laughs> give me... That's a really good one. Sorry, I'm taking time. I know it's a very stupid question. Um... I don't want to give a cheesy one of dog because I love dogs. Um, what's a good animal, man? What's a good animal? What's a good animal? Give me... I like this so much. Give me a whale. Fuck it. Give me a whale. Whale. Yeah, nobody has a whale, you see. I love whales. There you go. Whales. Whales. Uh, whale. Not because whale is like your crypto whale. Whales are very intelligent. They're very peaceful. They don't mess around with the other animals. They're just chilling and just swimming around. They're not assholes. They're massive. And they're, they're cool. They're really, really cool. So I'm going to go with whale. I like the answer. 
So part of the initiative of Crypto Gist is once we get the episode number 30, we will do an event in Dubai and I'll invite most of the Crypto Gist to the event and the NFT that we give to you will do an auction and we will use that money for a um, charity event for animal welfare. So that's the whole initiative also to put us and do something good for... I love, bro, bro, yeah. I love anything to do with animal welfare. I love. So you got my full support, man. There you go. Mario, my friend, thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing. We love your show. Um, do you, you have any last thought to give to the audience right now on Binance Live, YouTube and Twitter? A final tip or advice to everyone that is watching you right now? A final quote? Yeah, look, it, it's, I know a lot of you are likely hurting and it's really difficult. The same way it's difficult to not FOMO at the peak, it's also even more difficult to continue hustling at the bottom. But just remember, Bitcoin has been considered dead multiple, multiple times. Only a couple of years ago, Bitcoin was at, you know, under 5K, whatever, under 4K, I can't remember what it was. So we've been through worse. It's really hard to see the future. But if you find a way, whether it's you have some hobbies or I don't know what, I get a girlfriend, I don't care what. You find a way to keep hustling for the next mm -hmm. few months, even a year or two years, we don't know how long. It will pay off. You just got to consistently, consistently keep hustling within the space, especially at a time like this when things are quiet, because this is the time where you can build attention or build a portfolio or build a reputation within the space. Amazing. So, guys, you listen to Mario. And thank you so much, Mario, again. Keep hustling, everybody. I'll see you next week. We have two more episodes of Crypto Gears for 2022. And Mario, thank you again from, from me. I'm the team. Thanks, Andres. Thanks, bro. Ciao, amigos. Thanks, bro. Bye -bye. See you in Dubai, man. Ciao, Ciao. bro. Bye-bye.